Good morning, and welcome to the Eastside Church of Christ. We're going to continue our study today of the, uh, the time from Nehemiah to Nicodemus, what we might call the intertestamental period, uh, also including the post-exilic period. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the fourth solution. Uh, there, we, we've proposed four ways by which God's people uh, decided to, to solve the challenge and answer the question, how ought God's people to respond to their God, particularly coming out of Babylonian captivity when God has given them a chance for a do-over. <laughs> and uh, as, as much as we all long for the opportunity to do a do-over every now and then, uh, God's people really seem to be spending a lot of time thinking about how we ought to be, uh, how we ought to behave, uh, what, what were our values, what's going to be our response to this uh, process of, of reforming and re-becoming uh, the children of God. Uh, and so we have solution number one, um, learn how to get along, uh, be uh, amenable and uh, malleable uh, by whatever uh, group of people is in power at the time. Cyrus, uh, the Persian king, uh, sends uh, the Jews back to the Holy Land uh, to reestablish themselves. They're going to be good Persians as long as uh, Persia is in power. Uh, Alexander the Great's going to come down, um, and uh, now all of a sudden they're going to be good Macedonians. Later on, they'll be good uh, Egyptians under the Ptolemies and good Syrians under the Seleucids and ultimately a good Romans. The, the, that thought process says we have to get along with whoever's in power in order for us to worship God in the way he wants us to worship him. Uh, solution number two, uh, be powerful. Uh, don't bother to acquiesce to these uh, world powers. Just defeat them. <laughs> and uh, as odd as that sounds, for little tiny Israel, up against these huge world powers that, that completely surrounded them and, and were bringing armies four, five, ten times the size of any army that Israel could muster. They did nonetheless have a period of uh, relative independence, uh, and that was as a result of the thought process number two, uh, find a way uh, through God's power, and they gave God the credit for these military victories that they had, find a way to defeat the powers of the world such that you can be the Davidic kingdom uh, reinstated. Uh, solution number three we talked about last week is uh, be a good law keeper. That breaks into two parts, people who keep the law and acquire power as a result of uh, being uh, well thought of by the people and thus uh, having the people respond to them when they call for law keeping, when they call for the formation of an army, when they call for a revolt, uh, those folks are, are on one side. The other side is the people we're going to talk about today who say we're going to be good law keepers, but we don't want power. In fact, power corrupts, and uh, we certainly don't want absolute power to become corrupted absolutely. And so instead, we're going to have a tendency to be separate. We're we're going to be called out. Now, there's good foundational uh, support for this, uh, this response. Throughout uh, God's interaction with his people, uh, he has called his people to be called out, to be separate, to be holy. Uh, the entire book of Leviticus is focused around uh, how uh, a human people can nonetheless be counted holy and uh, the, the rules and regulations of Leviticus are all connected to that, uh, to that command. You shall be holy, for I am holy. And so from its very foundation, we have this kind of separatist talk. I am the Lord your God, who separated you from the peoples. You are therefore to make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, between the unclean bird and the clean, you shall not make yourself detestable by any animal or by any bird or by anything that creeps on the ground, which I have separated for you as unclean. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. Uh, 
and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. Built into that idea of being a separate people is several other forms of separatism. For example, the Nazarite vow that uh, survived uh, on into Jesus' time and even after uh, that time, described in the book of Numbers. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of the Nazarite, which just means one who has been separated, to dedicate himself to the Lord, he shall abstain from wine and strong drink, and goes on to list a number of other qualifications, uh, a, a, an avoidance of haircuts. For one thing, speaks to those of us who are uh, uh, getting a little shaggy as a result of uh, not being able to get into the, to the uh, barber. Uh, but uh, this idea of the Nazarite vow is, a, is an example of a notch up from the level of separation that God calls all of his people to have. Uh, here's another uh, form of separation, the, the setting aside of the Levites uh, for their special role. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the sons of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. Then after that, the Levites may go in and, and serve the tent of meeting, but you shall cleanse them and present them as a wave offering, for they are wholly given to me from among the sons of Israel. I have taken them for myself instead of every first issue of the, room, of the womb, the firstborn of all the sons of Israel. And so you have this idea in mind that there are going to be various forms of separation, but the idea of being God's children is going to contain the idea of being separate. Solomon affirms this when he does his dedicatory prayer uh, for the temple in 1 Kings 8. You have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance, as you spoke through Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers forth from Egypt, O Lord God. So by the time Ezra is bringing the first batch of people back from Babylonian captivity to reform uh, the, the worship of God, uh, to rebuild the temple and to reestablish the priesthood and the Levitical structure, necessary to get back to a normal kind of, of worship mode, there is this strong uh, theme of being separate, being set apart, being exclusive uh, from the rest of the world. The exiles observed Passover on the 14th of the first month, for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves together. All of them were pure, then they slaughtered the Passover lamb for all of the exiles, both their brothers, the priests, and for themselves. The sons of Israel who returned from exile and all those who had separated themselves from the impurity of the nations of the land to join them to seek the Lord of Israel ate the Passover together, and they observed the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had caused them to rejoice, had turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. Um, so there are good foundational scriptural concepts for this idea of being separate. And this is going to get implied in Ezra's uh, account of the restoration uh, of the, the children of Israel and, and the children of God. Uh, in the ninth chapter, he records, Now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land, according to their abominations. Those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. This is the traditional listing of all the people who once occupied the land of Canaan and who have been defeated and at least in theory, according to God's instructions, have been uh, wiped out uh, so that there's no longer a temptation uh, to acclimate themselves to the people around them as opposed to becoming truly God's people uh, with a purity of worship that characterizes God's people. Uh, so we have this traditional list of all these people. And here we've just regathered, we've just started rebuilding, we've just started to implement the worship of God, the, the good, pure, scripturally based worship of God. And here are these people intermarrying. And we know what the result of that is going to be. 
They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. Um, clearly, Ezra's application of this idea of being separate is going to include not intermarrying with the people around you. And uh, that has good historical foundation as well as good biblical uh, foundation for these folks. They have a tendency to acquire uh, new religious practices based on marrying the people of the land. Sometimes they don't even bother to marry the people of the land. They just acquire the religion. And uh, that clearly is not what God has in mind. And uh, they haven't been in back in the land very long when Ezra has to deal with this. This is how he chooses to deal with it. Nehemiah is going to have uh, some of the same uh, observations when he has the commitment um, of, this, of the city of Jerusalem. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, the wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who have knowledge and understanding are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. This is the people of God making God a promise. We will not fall into those old patterns. We will instead find ways of, of uh, meeting your expectations and perhaps even exceeding them. So they're taking on this curse uh, and oath to walk in God's ways, and then they get more specific uh, of how that's going to happen. Uh, this law was given through Moses, God's servant, uh, and to keep and observe all the commandments of God our Lord and his ordinances and his statutes, that we will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. As for the peoples of the land who will bring wares or grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. We will forego the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We, will also place, uh, we also placed ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. That's called the temple tax once there is a temple rebuilt. And by the time of Jesus, we've experienced some inflation. It's now a half shekel. Uh, for the showbread, the continual grain offering, the continual burnt offerings, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. Nehemiah makes a pretty broad promise here, uh, and the people who are following him and, and working to reestablish uh, the nation of Israel as a viable geopolitical entity are saying, and, and they are connecting this idea here, that doing what God wants us to do is really central to our mission, and as a part of that, we are going to separate ourselves from the people around us. So we're, we're going to be visibly uh, different. King James uh, calls that a peculiar people. Uh, sometimes we're peculiar in different ways. Jeremiah provides some, uh, some foundation for this. Jeremiah, of course, is prophesying prior to the uh, uh, Babylonian captivity, uh, but he, he talks about how impure the people have become and how they need to strive for purity. Uh, I have made you, God's words, uh, I have made you an assayer and a tester among our people that you may know and assay their way. All of them are stubbornly rebellious, going about as a talebearer. They are bronze and iron. They all of them are corrupt. The bellows blow fiercely. The lid is consumed by the fire. In vain the refining goes on, but the wicked are not separated. They call them rejected silver because the Lord has rejected them. If you are impure in any way, you cannot be a part of the people of God in spite of the fact that you live right there in Jerusalem. You may even be making offerings at the temple and and doing all the right things, but Jeremiah says you're out of relationship, and that kind of behavior is just not going to be allowed. He will continue to try to purify you, uh, and that purification process can be painful. So we have strong precedents <clears throat> for this idea of separation. Number one, it's a foundational concept in the Torah, the first five books, 
uh, of the Jewish Bible, what we would call the Old Testament. Uh, clearly, this is an idea that's, uh, that's uh, included in the Levitical uh, law and uh, all of the practices of Leviticus and Numbers and then restated in Deuteronomy uh, call for this idea that we're going to be unique, we're going to be different, we're going to be visibly, clearly not a part of the people around us. It's then supported by all of this prophetic writing and the prophetic preaching that happens, both the prophetic preaching that happens before the Babylonian captivity and then in particular the preaching and, and prophetic writing that happens uh, post-captivity. Uh, as they come back together, as Ezra leads the rebuilding of the religion, Nehemiah leads the rebuilding of the people, they become more and more devoted to this idea that we just have to do these things uh, because that's what makes us God's people. It also meshes and mates up with our, our inherent human response when we feel God's presence and we feel God's love, we really have a strong drive to say, I'd, I'd really like to be the person that God would have me be. And, and we frequently will have one of those conversion experiences where we'll say, I'm, I'm just not going to hang out with the people I used to hang out with. I'm, I'm not going to be like them. I'm not going to use their vocabulary. I'm not going to do the things they do. I want to be separate. That's a natural human response to the discovery of a relationship with God. It's going to work itself out in a number of ways in this intertestamental period between Nehemiah and Nicodemus. Uh, Nehemiah is going to refuse help from the Samaritans. Now there's some question as to the Samaritans' uh, motivation in doing this. Chances are much better that the Samaritans thought they were going to discover Nehemiah's plans and find some way to throw a monkey wrench in the plans. But Nehemiah doesn't allow for them to become part of that, even though it might have been tempting. And he turned them from at least potential friends into enemies uh, as a result of doing that. But it seemed like the right thing to do. And from the results that he got, it appears that it was the right thing to do. Uh, likewise, Ezra's emphasis on ethnic purity um, coming to the point even of dissolving marriages that had been made uh, with foreign uh, wives and, and involving children. Um, he says we, we have to go back to uh, this model that is, that is us separated from the world. Uh, the Hasmoneans, uh, uh, Judas Maccabeus and his uh, crowd are going to separate themselves any number of times. Usually, however, <laughs> This is to avoid the consequences of having just killed somebody or, or uh, won a battle and uh, defeated a, a Syrian general. And uh, so, of course, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is, is going to say, <laughs> you can't do that. Send a huge army and, and uh, Judas and, and his army then head for the hills and they separate themselves. But their language as they do that is not, I'm running away from a fight, but it's, I'm going to live to fight another day, and I'm going to live because I am separate. And they're going to refer back to these scriptures that we've been talking about as the means by which they need to be separate. And of course, ultimately, viable uh, maintenance uh, and, and ongoing maintenance of the Jewish religion is going to require uh, some separation. If you don't separate, uh, when there are military conflicts, then you're going to have to get involved in the military conflict and serve in the army. Or you can do what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, where you just say, okay, you attack me on the Sabbath. I'm not going to work on the Sabbath. End of discussion. Uh, you're going to kill me. Uh, there, there are few choices under these circumstances where religious freedom is not an option. And uh, so all of God's people are going to have to decide in this point, Am I going to fight? Am I going to be a politically oriented uh, person of God? Uh, or am I going to separate myself, go find a hill to live on that's not easy to find, and just eke out a living? And that brings us to the results of this withdrawal. Uh, almost invariably, this kind of withdrawal within the context that we're talking about 
is going to have some unavoidable results. Number one is going to be a life of poverty. You're just not going to be able to make the money that you would be able to make if you were living, say, in Jerusalem or one of the other major cities uh, because there aren't the business opportunities there. You're going to live up in the hills. Agriculture is not going to be nearly as good up there. Uh, you can't really develop a large flock of, of uh, animals because uh, you're going to have to move from time to time depending on when the army is coming through. Uh, and so that requirement of mobility uh, also requires that you not have a lot of stuff with you. And so poverty is a, almost an inevitable result in addition to which you have the social isolation. I no longer have the support of family and friends uh, because I left them behind in order to head for the hills and maintain my separation. The second one is, is intriguing, and I'd like for us to spend a little time with this one. Um, you can live isolated and live a life that is devoted to God, but if you are living in the Jewish system, your life devoted to God is not going to include temple worship because temple worship at, at best of times is going to happen in Jerusalem and you're a long ways from Jerusalem. In the times of outside interference, such as the Seleucid uh, campaign against the Hasmoneans, um, there's, there's no temple worship going on at all, even in Jerusalem. The temple has been desecrated. They offered a pig on the, uh, on the holy altar of sacrifice uh, and they offered it to a foreign god and they're just it was going to have to be cleansed before any further temple worship was going to occur. That leads to an interesting question. Am I worshiping God if I am not doing the things that God told me to do? Even if I can't do those things, I still have to answer this question. Is, is this valid worship? If I can't get to Jerusalem, even if I could get to Jerusalem, I can't get a sacrifice offered. And even if I could get a sacrifice offered, it would be an impure sacrifice because the temple has been desecrated. What does that mean for God's people who want to maintain their relationship, who want to have an effective worship life? Uh, what, what does that mean for them? Are, are they in relationship with God when they're not just separated, but, um, uh, but they're, they're left with this uh, option that's, that's not really a good option. The third result is a life spent on the run for the, from the authorities. Uh, and God's people have spent a lot of time uh, on the run from authorities that would like to persecute them, would like to, to wipe them out. Uh, and so this is, this is a time of testing, a time of purifying of God's people. Uh, and a time that really causes God's people to do some self-evaluation. Not all that much unlike the times in which we're living today. So uh, here are the questions that withdrawal uh, causes us to act. Uh, how does one worship Yahweh when the temple stands but daily sacrifices are stopped? We, we can no longer do the things that the Levitical law and in fact the uh, the law as put down in Exodus and restated in Deuteronomy uh, require. We can't do those things. Well, what does God expect of us? And of course, to a certain extent, this was answered when they went into Babylonian captivity. The temple is destroyed. The altar is gone. Uh, all of the objects of worship, the, the objects that implemented worship, uh, are either destroyed or they have been taken and put into the Babylonian treasury. And uh, uh, God's people have to, have to decide at that point what constitutes effective worship when none of that exists. Even after they return under the Edict of Cyrus, they still don't have a temple at first. Okay, so what's the process here? Well, the process is they build an altar and they immediately start sacrificing. Is that sufficient? You see, asking those questions causes God's people to get to the core question, which is, what's the foundation of my relationship with God? And at least as importantly, what's the foundation of us as a congregation, as a people of God, a worshiping community? What's the core value of our relationship as a body to God? Those are questions that 
we're in very many ways asking, even, even now that we're starting to meet together physically, we're so limited in the numbers that we can have together and so limited in the time uh, and the amount of contact that we can have, we have to go back to that question of what's the core value here? What, what's truly at the central point, the, the locus of what we do as God's people? It's a, it's a timely discussion to have. Uh, how does one worship Yahweh after the temple has fallen? Uh, by the time Jesus comes, the temple is just glorious, beautiful, uh, noteworthy edifice uh, that Herod has, uh, has helped pay for and, and has provided a lot of material for and made sure that it was built according to the Jews' uh, standards. Um, uh, and and it's, this, it's this wonderful uh, building uh, and Jesus, uh, when, when that's brought to his attention by his disciples, responds by saying, you know, it's not going to be for just a few years. Uh, all that's going to be gone. And, and his disciples can't even imagine. They, they just cannot, in their, in their wildest dreams, they can't imagine a, a life worshiping God without the temple. They've become so acclimated to that. Well, was this the original Solomon Temple? No, it wasn't. It was a rebuilding uh, that began under Ezra and Nehemiah. But we become accustomed to the idea that the way things are is the way things will always be. Once again, we're finding that that's, uh, that's not necessarily the case. Perhaps the most familiar model that we have of those who isolate themselves in the name of maintaining their purity and their holiness uh, and their relationship with God. As the Qumran community, this is the, the group uh, of, I'm well, pretty sure they were Essenes, uh, who uh, pulled uh, people away from Jerusalem and, and the major population centers around there, went off to live in the desert, and ultimately left us uh, proof of their uh, existence and of their worship forms uh, through the Dead Sea Scrolls and through the uh, the archaeological work that has been done uh, from, their, uh, from their community. Uh, and uh, these, these folks provide us with a pretty good idea of how this had worked itself out by the time Jesus comes on board. Qum Qumran community undoubtedly uh, was alive and well and fully functioning and attracting people while Jesus was doing his earthly ministry. Uh, and you could almost think of them as being uh, a counter narrative to Jesus. Jesus uh, arrives, he is the word of God, he has uh, decided to dwell among us in the, the words of the first chapter of John, uh, and, and he is just so radically different. We're going to spend the rest of our quarter uh, talking about how radically different he is from the expectations of the Jewish people. Here's the Qumran community providing a different approach, but a much more familiar different approach uh, than the one that Jesus is going to provide. Uh, here are the characteristics that are uh, intriguing about this uh, community of separatists. Uh, number one, they're exclusively male. There are no, uh, no women in these communities. Uh, there are women who have relationships with uh, these men, sisters, mothers, and folks like that. Uh, but they are uh, excluded from the, from the central community. Uh, and that's going to be an interesting point as the first century church develops. Uh, how inclusive are we going to be across lines of gender? Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, they're not only exclusively male, but they are exclusively unmarried, or if they have been married, they're going to become unmarried uh, in order to be part of, of this community. Uh, they hold all their property in common. Uh, if you are brought in as a novice, uh, you will sign your property over to the community, which will hold your property pretty much of what we would today call a trust. Uh, we'll hold your property. You no longer own it. But if you don't make it through your novitiate, through your initiation process, and you decide to leave the community, you'll take your property back with you. A remarkable, uh, remarkably forward-thinking uh, thought process with these folks. They have some what we might call monasteries. So these are long before actual monasteries were founded, uh, so we might call them a proto-monastery. There's some of those located in the large cities uh, 
Uh, and we have some record of uh, Essenes moving from one community to the next and kind of sort of evangelizing, certainly proselytizing people into their communities. But most are going to be in wilderness uh, uh, organizations and the Qumran community being the, uh, the essential one that tells us about that. Uh, there's a three-year novitiate before you gain full entrance into the community of the Holy Ones, the set-apart uh, people. You will be sort of set apart, but you're clearly going to be a second, maybe even a third-class citizen in this community. Until the three years have gone by, you've demonstrated that you're acquiring the knowledge and the teaching and that you're going to fit in with this community. Uh, there is an elected community presider. Uh, this is the person who's going to provide virtually all authority. This is also the person who's going to do the bulk of the uh, interpretation uh, of the Word of God. Uh, it, uh, it, it, the, character, the community is characterized uh, by the rejection of temple worship. Now, the temple is still there. By the time Jesus comes along, uh, Worship in the temple has not only been fully restored, but it's been fully restored for 150, 200 years. Um, and, and if you don't count the break in between the Hasmoneans and the, the Romans, uh, it's really been in place for four or 500 years. Uh, the, the, the worship in the temple uh, is pretty solidly established by the time Jesus comes. Uh, and uh, to reject temple worship as a Jew uh, was to reject a pretty central concept. Uh, Jesus, of course, uh, uses the temple as a teaching opportunity, uh, and, and the first century church, uh, post-Pentecost, is going to use the temple uh, at the very least as a gathering point, but certainly as an opportunity for preaching, for proclaiming God's word, and for acquiring uh, new uh, converts. Uh, in that regard. So to reject that and to reject the animal sacrifices that go along with that is to make a pretty significant departure from the, the nature of historical Judaism. Uh, and that's remarkable in its own right. Uh, certainly uh, the, the converts to Christianity from Judaism in its traditional temple-oriented uh, uh, process are going to be required to rethink a lot of this stuff. Uh, the Qumran community and other Essene communities have already rethought some of it. And they've decided that animal sacrifice and orientation toward temple, orientation toward a high priest, uh, a reliance on uh, set-apart people uh, of the Levitical strain as opposed to personally set-apart uh, people who've gone through the training and who are now a full-fledged part of the community. That's a radical departure from traditional Judaism. It indicates the ability of these people to think outside the box. It's just a question of how many of them are going to think outside that box. And then beyond that, how many of those are going to see Jesus as the Messiah? Of course, we'll see that in Acts, that a significant number of them uh, who recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, the, the Essenes reject the Pharisees. The Pharisees reject the Essenes. Uh, and so they are at odds with each other. What that means is Jesus, in his rejection of the Pharisees, probably gathered some of these people who understood Essene thought, but who didn't like the approach or who recognized the need for something more than the approach that the Essenes had. And so when Jesus comes uh, onto the scene, they see, ah, you see, he's... He's got a clearer idea of what this is about. And so there's undoubtedly some mixing of the thought process and the Essenes help to gather the disciples around Jesus and to uh, empower that process uh, by having that outside-the-box thinking uh, going on. Uh, and they are, of course, still active during Jesus' ministry. They disappear in the, uh, the years from 66 to 70, uh, which uh, may be familiar uh, years for you. 66 is the beginning of the Jewish rebellion. Uh, the Qumran community in particular, the Essenes in general, uh, responded to this rebellion by being a part of those, uh, those armies. Uh, 
Uh, and as a consequence, they were wiped out on a fairly regular basis because Rome brought a really sharp general by the name of Vespasian who had tens of thousands of troops uh, and he could just simply outlast you. The, the story of Masada uh, is the story of uh, God's people uh, holding up in a, in a fortress that, uh, that Herod had built in case he ever fell out of favor. And the, and the Romans just said, okay, I've got months. How much food do you have up there? And uh, that was kind of the way that they got that, uh, got that all pretty well wiped out. Uh, but the Essenes uh, bought into, for the most part, this rebellion in 66. Of course, by, by 70, the, the temple is destroyed. Jerusalem is, is uh, evacuated and, and uh, no longer a Jewish city. Um, and, and so all of that comes to an end uh, at that point. Uh, separationism in the early church uh, is uh, interesting. It begins, of course, as a Jewish church. The question in Acts 8, do we accept Samaritans? Uh, Philip has gone up and done some missionary work. We're not sure if he was supposed to do that or not. Well, yes, turns out he was supposed to do that. So Samaritans, yes. How about Gentiles? Acts 10. Peter's not at all convinced that the Gentiles should be included, but he is called to do that, and to his credit, he does go and uh, preach what he's, what he's supposed to preach and gets the necessarily undesired results, but Gentiles are going to be there. Acts 15, are we going to allow uncircumcised Gentiles, or do they have to become practitioners of Judaism in order to be a part of that? So separationism is built into the thought process of the first century church, it's easy to think of in, in New Testament terms of our Savior as a separationist. When you read things like the seventh chapter of Hebrews, it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, referring to Jesus, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Uh, that idea of separated from sinners can sound kind of monastic. We need to we need to keep some distance between us, uh, the devoted practitioners of this religion, and the unwashed masses out there. Uh, but it should be noted, Jesus was never socially or physically separated from sinners. In fact, he ministered to the most sinful. Uh, he ministered to people that, uh, that his disciples frequently were uncomfortable even hanging out with. Think about the Samaritan woman uh, at the well in chapter 4 of, of John, um, he, he's talking to her and they're kind of saying, I can think of 15 reasons you ought not to be talking to her, and yet an entire community will be converted as a result of his outreach to, to sinners. Um, <clears throat> clearly, John has this idea in mind when he says, the word became flesh and lived among us, literally pitched his tent right in the middle of our community. We have seen his glory, the glory is of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Back to the Hebrew writer then, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. We have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So really our calling is no different from his calling except that we're not uh, sinless except to the extent that we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the question for us in the year of our Lord 2020 is how comfortable are we with being among sinners versus how comfortable are we being kind of isolated and cloistered and uh, fellowship unto ourselves? There is a comfort that comes from being insulated from the outside world, especially when the outside world looks as messed up as our outside world currently does. There's a comfort that comes from hanging around people who have shared beliefs. Uh, there's a comfort that comes from shared practices. We've always worshiped this way, and we're gonna keep worshiping this way, and that just makes me feel good. And I have to admit, I stand right at the front of that line. I like the way I grew up worshiping, and I like the songs that we sang and, and the prayers that we prayed and, the, and those things are, are part of my growing up and my culture, and, and I understand the value of those things. And on top of all of that, there's the discomfort that we have with change. And I 
despise change. It's just, it's just not fun. Uh, uh, and then one more thing to add to that, there's the intrusive effect that you have from people coming in from outside. Um, they require special work that, that those of us who've been initiated uh, don't require. We, we have to sometimes uh, put up with certain things that are, that are anomalous to our group, but that we're going to have to uh, get used to as these other people come in. And, and that's, uh, that's discomforting. So the real question is, are we as a church so focused on the core truths of what it means to be God's people that we can, in fact, uh, allow change to occur while at the same time staying true to that core truth that pulls us together into a body in the first place. On that note, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have called us to be your people in spite of the fact that we are so many and so varied uh, and we have such different backgrounds and we have different values and we bring different approaches and different perspectives into the body of your son, um, both here uh, locally at Eastside and also in the larger context of the church uh, in general. Uh, thank you for those opportunities for us to see things differently, for us to be a separate people, a peculiar people, but at the same time a welcoming, inclusive, and growing people. Would you bless us with the wisdom to differentiate between those things that are central and must be clung to and those things that are peripheral and must be adapted to the changing world in which we live. We recognize that in that world, you are in control. And we thank you for that as well. It's through your son that we pray.